All right, guys, let's talk about the First Amendment. I'm actually very excited to talk to you about this. I always say that because I get so excited to get into this stuff, but I kind of can't wait to review this with you guys in class because it's such a powerful and important subject and so relevant to the world today and in the past and in the future because what's the first amendment ultimately about where does it come from why does it exist why should we protect it right and i'll give you a little foreshadowing of where i'm going with this right the the first amendment ultimately is about communication keeping relationships together keeping the world working because why because human beings have conflict it's our nature to disagree but we have to be able to disagree in a way that leads to constructive evolution okay so as a background i want to teach you a little bit of the reasoning why the first amendment exists then talk about the limitations on it and then ultimately this is what i want you to get if you're in my if you're in my law and ethics class i want you to understand the distinction between governing an area of human activity through the realm or domain of ethics, which is the soft side of human control, or governing a certain area of human behavior through the domain of law, which is the hard side of social control. Okay, This is a very important distinction. It'll come a little later in our discussion. But I think there's some wisdom that's important for us to discover here. All right, so let's, let's dive into this. All right, the First Amendment. So, what is the First Amendment essentially saying? I mean, there's several components to it. You know, we have freedom of religion, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of the press, we have freedom of assembly. I'm mostly going to focus on freedom of speech, okay? However, I want you to think about something with me for a moment. Think about what the First Amendment's really protecting. Freedom of religion, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of press. If you think about what's really being protected, it's not just your right to say something or your right to believe something, right? Ultimately, what the First Amendment is protecting is the freedom to think something. If you can't express yourself in words, if you can't express yourself through, you know, your religious beliefs, if you can't connect and hang out with the people you want to, you know, freedom of assembly, if you can't express yourself in writing or investigating, then 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 ultimately at some point you're going to lose your capacity to deeply think what you want to think in a free way. And then of course, well why does that matter? right? Why does it matter that we have freedom of thought? Well, because at the end of the day, all of us as human beings want to evolve into a higher, better, more enjoyable, more prosperous world. And that's what it's ultimately about. That's what this rule is ultimately about. And I'll, I'll explain this to you. So there's two worlds that we're talking about. We're talking about the marketplace of ideas that the First Amendment is seeking to advance and protect. And we're talking about political free speech, All right? And remember the backdrop of this, you might remember from earlier in the class, all legal rules have rationales, meaning they have a reason for their existence. What is the underlying reason behind the rule? Like don't, you know, speeding 65 miles an hour. Well, yeah, but why? It used to be 55, then it was 65. Some places it's 70, some places 75. In Europe, on the Autobahn, there's certain sections that have no speed. Why is the rule what it is? Because the rule is not about the number, the rule is about safety. The speed limit's not there to tell you how fast to drive. The speed limit's there as an indicator of the maximum speed that's deemed safe in that location at that stage in history. Right? So when cars first came out, I'm sure the speed limit was a lot slower because they weren't as safe. As the technology advances and cars are safer, the speed limit goes up. Why? Because the rule is not the speed limit, the number, that's not the rule. The rule is safe travel. And so therefore, as technology advances, it's you can go faster and still be safe. So the rule is 65 miles an hour, but the rationale is safety. And by understanding the rationale, you really get the purpose of the rule, which is really the rule itself. That's the same thing I'm saying here. The First Amendment, you have freedom of speech, is the rule. But it's not the rationale. The rationale behind why do you have freedom of speech is we want to advance the marketplace of ideas. We want to advance political free speech. But why? Well, the marketplace of ideas is the free exchange of information between human beings. And we're always evolving, we're growing, we're learning, we're understanding. And so somebody comes up with a new invention, a new concept, a, a new uh, dis, uh, organizational structure, all, whatever it is that's a new idea. We want to be able to have a robust, complete, unhindered debate about whether th this new idea is good or bad or how it could be improved. Why? Because we want to make the world better. 
right? So ultimately, we want to make the world a better place, right? This is the ultimate rationale. We make the world better by having freedom of communication about any given idea at any different stage of history about any given subject. We communicate and we share. We are knowledge creatures. I was thinking about that the other day, like how much, you know, we all identify with the physical world. And it's true. We are physical. But human beings, what's fundamentally distinct about us from the higher primates? You know, they're, they're, they're such beautiful animals. The, the gorilla, the orangutan, the chimpanzee, the bonobo. They're awesome. Some, but they don't use symbolic abstract speech, right? Meaning language. Like they have language, but they don't use symbolic abstract speech, meaning words, right? And concepts. I'm, I'm not sure the degree to which they futurize. They imagine into the future and contemplate outcomes. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I know there's some rudimentary tool use amongst ch chimpanzees and orangutans, but in other words, all I'm trying to say is we are knowledge creatures. We're beings of ideas and evolution, and we thrive when we can fully um, share our ideas. And then importantly, when you share an idea, it's got to be looked at by multiple people from multiple angles so we can figure out what's great about it and what sucks about it. And that's why we have freedom of speech, is to advance the marketplace of ideas, to make the world better, to come up with the best stuff. Got to be able to do dissent about this idea. We got to be able to criticize it so we can carve it out and make it that shining diamond of awesomeness. That's what it's about. Okay, that's that side. Now, the other side, which is, you know, maybe... I don't know if it's uniquely American, but it's one of the big things we have as a culture is political free speech, which is ultimately the power and the right to criticize the government. And why does it matter? Well, because before this, right, fundamentally, there were kings and queens and monarchies, right? And then the, the authority of the church and the pope through the Middle Ages, right? So, you know, here we are, these, these individuals, right? And so, I don't know, this is all of us, right, in the Middle Ages. And we're like, we're getting crushed by the king and the pope. And they're telling us what to believe and what to think and, and where we can live and who we can marry and blah, blah, blah. You know, like that horrible scene in Braveheart where the king, you know, goes and takes the guy's wife. He just got married and he goes and sleeps. with. It's just a horrible thing. You don't want those kind of rules, those kind of systems. So you got to be able to um, fight. You got to be able to speak out against you know, the governing power, the king at that time, and now it's, you know, a, a state. Why? So that we can improve it, so we can make it better, so we don't have to live like paupers or peasants, right? Like, we don't want to live that way. We want to live as, as free human beings. Why? Because we're knowledge creatures. We're higher level creatures. We deserve to be free. We deserve to live. We deserve to express. So we have to have a governing system that allows for the freedom of expression so we can be happy and share and love and connect and grow. That's why. So it's the same idea on this side, on the political free speech side. It's the same thing. We want to make the world better. I don't know why my writing's so bad, guys. But anyway, we want to make the world better. Okay, it's the same idea. Improve it. Improve happiness. Improve the physical conditions of the world. Improve the, the governing conditions of the world. It's the basic idea. That's why we want freedom of speech. We want it to accomplish these goals. That's the legal rationale behind the scenes. Okay. Now, can you say anything you want, anywhere you want, anytime you want? No. Why? Well, because the purpose of rules, right? The purpose of order is to create safety and well-being. And there are limits to everything in life. But those limits have to be weighed in a, in a way that, that is, is that it, where you apply critical thinking and clarity to understand where is the boundary. And that's what's really cool about this next section I'm going to teach you. You don't have the right to say anything you want, anytime you want, but this is cool. Because I had an insight about this. I was like, whoa, that's really interesting. Like why these limitations exist. And here's what I want to show you. There's five limitations on free speech. But what I'm going to show you is there is essentially no governance of the world of ideas because the world of ideas is not physical. It's just floating through the mind. The world of ideas is essentially eternally, infinitely free. It's the physical world that ultimately gets regulated. And that's an insight that I want you to take away. See if you can see it as I build. Watch. There's five limitations on free speech. Number one, clear and present danger. Clear and present danger. You can't say fire in a crowded theater. It creates a clear and present danger. Keyword danger. Right? You can't do things that are going to incite a crowd to go and, and mow everybody over as they're trying to escape a burning building that's not burning. You're going to create danger. And where is the danger happening? Is it happening in the world of ideas? 
or is it happening in the physical world? It's happening in the physical world. So the limitation on free speech isn't a limitation on the world of ideas, it's a limitation on the impact on the physical world of action. Clear and present danger, you can't do that. What's the second one? Fighting words, like you know, going up to someone and saying, hey, I'm gonna knock you out, right? And then they punch you. Well, <laughs> you don't have the right to go and threaten someone. You know, saying something that incites violence from another person in a direct way, you can't do that. Why not? Do you see where I'm going? It's not the idea that's being regulated, it's the impact of the idea, right? So the impact of this idea is it creates a world of physical violence because you're eliciting a violent response from someone. So this is a limitation on free speech, you can't do that, but what is it that you can't do? You can't create violence. And it's not that you can't speak, it's that you can't create violence. Now, yeah, I get that. It is the words creating the violence, but notice that the words have a direct impact on the physical world. Let's look at another one, false advertising. Okay, you can't do that. You can't say, oh, well, my product is gonna cure cancer and you have no studies to show it or you know, saying, oh, this car is gonna get a thousand miles a gallon you know, and it gets like 20 miles a gallon. False advertising, you can't do that. But why not? Why can't you just say whatever you want? Free speech. Well, because why? Think about it. What's the impact on the customer, right? So customer injury. I mean, if it's you're selling a supplement or a, some kind of a drug or something and, and you lie about its effects, well, you could hurt someone. Impact on the physical world. If you lie about the car, well, now this person's economically affected. You know, they're not going to be able to get the gas mileage they want or, or maybe they're polluting their environment that they didn't want to, etc. So false advertising, you can't do that. Why? Because of its impact on the physical world. Now look at this, defamation. Now this is where we start to get a little bit blurry because these last two I think start to get a little blurry. But again, in the law, there's always general rule and exception. And the exceptions are usually carved out in a very specific way. And that's important to think when you are thinking legal, you put on your legal thinking cap, you wanna be thinking about the rationale for the rule the general rule, the exception, what's the rationale for the exception to the rule? What's the reason for the exception? And that helps you stay balanced so that you don't go down a slippery slope and go from general rule exception, anything goes. Because you don't want that. You want to regulate things in a systematic way that has a positive purpose, I would hope. So defamation, what are you regulating? Well, defamation is a false statement that's injurious to another person's character. It hurts the person's reputation, right? So if you say, oh, this guy's a thief or, or that guy, you know, stole from me or, or this person's, you know, uh, whatever it might be that you're trying to def defame, you're saying something negative that hurts their character or reputation. What's the damage? The damage is to reputation. We're not saying you can't give your opinion about someone. We're saying that you can't make a false statement that injures a, th a, th a person and a third party hears it. And why? Well, because that third party might, want not, might not want to do business with them anymore. So the person loses money. That person might not uh, want to go on a date with that person anymore. So they lose love. That person might not want to whatever. So they lose you know, um, social connection. So you're actually injuring someone's physical reality. You know, and I can see there's a little bit of emotional thing through, but you're really injuring someone's financial or physical reality. So you can't do that. And then the fifth one, I know maybe I'm going a little fast, but stay with me. The fifth one is obscenity. And this is interesting because this one is a little bit in a gray area. Okay, think about this for a second. First Amendment free speech, like, well, pornography is okay, or art's okay, or you know, a, a painting of a naked woman or a naked man or someone, something like that's okay. Um, you know, you, obviously you can't have naked pictures of you know, younger parts of the society. We get that, right? Because we want to protect people. So there's always this sort of sense of protection that's in the background of why is something not allowed. But obscenity is interesting because it's on the fringe of, well, is it, is, it, is it artwork or is it just degrading to morals, right? And let me explain this a little bit. So in the obscenity cases, what's looked at, there's a three-part test. And essentially the test is, does this, whatever it is, let's say it's a, a naked picture, or it's a magazine, or it's something on the internet, does this picture or movie or whatever it is, does this have artistic merit? 
right? Does like it does it really have artistic quality to it? Is someone trying to express something, or are they just trying to degrade the human body or the the, the human condition or something like that? And it's it's that's a, it's a little bit of a judgment call, I and mean, it is, right? And then is it patently offensive? Right? Is it patently offensive? And I think there's a test for the local community. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember if it's a national test or a local test, but is it basically offensive? It's slipping my mind right now what the third element is, but the essence is basically this. Is this whatever you're produ producing, is it something that's so patently offensive that has no artistic redeeming merit that it's not worthy of being put out there? And it's a gray question, it is. But the point is we're trying to protect the morals right of the community and that's why this is a a gray case because all of these were about protecting the physical world physical injury this is about protecting the moral world or the community's world or the social world so it's a really gray area and then from here i could easily see how you could have precedents that continue along this line that make it possible to regulate more and more speech because we can point to you know an injury to the community to the morals or to the emotions of someone Okay. For example, you know, there, there's a there's a tort um, in there's a, a tort called emotional infl intentional infliction of emotional distress, and that's not allowed, right? And that's where you are by extreme and outrageous conduct intentionally causing emotional harm to someone. Like, let's say you know someone's afraid of spiders, they're deathly afraid of spiders, and you dump a whole bunch of spiders on their head while they're sitting at their desk. Like that makes them go into like you know a, a shock, and it's it's very painful for them and they have nightmares, like, you can't do that, right? Of course, I guess that wasn't really speech, right? That was putting spiders. What about this? What if you call someone, this is horrible, don't, of course don't do this, but you call someone as a prank, which is a horrible prank, and you say, oh my God, you know, so-and-so just died that you love, and then they, they have like a heart attack. Like, you can't do that to someone, right? Even though you have free speech, you can't cause that harm. So that's emo uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress by extreme and outrageous conduct. But that's the factor. And so the court would look at, is this activity extreme and outrageous? And then we as a community would judge whether it is or isn't. So there are limits, all right? But we want to look at those limits based on the background. What's the value of the speech? It's not really valuable to call someone and say so-and-so's dead right? What's the value of the speech versus what's the negative impact? And so in general, the limitations on free speech are limiting the, the impact on the physical world. And I can see a little bit of a, of a crossover into the immoral and emotional world in obscenity. Now, I want to now say, say this last piece to you. Remember in the beginning I said I was going to talk about <clears throat> ethics as the soft form of social control and law as the hard form of social control. Here's what I want to talk about. So I want you to look at the realm of ethics and the realm of law. Right? And remember the, the distinction that, that, let's go this way, law imposes physical penalties. Could be fines, could be jail, could be, you know, basically that's it. Fines or jail or death penalty, but I don't think we're going to go there here. But that's a physical thing, but you have to have a quantifiable harm to impose a physical uh, penalty. Otherwise, it's, it's a little sketchy, like how does that work? We want it to be clear, measurable. We want it to be reviewable by a higher court. We want it to all be based on reason and metrics and logic and systems so that we can you know, keep things clean. Whereas over here, ethics is not necessarily as um, sort of, what could I say, as as detailed in terms of its proof. Ethics is more the concepts and principles that we expect people to live by to remain in the community. And what's the uh, penalty for violating ethics? Fundamentally, the penalty for violating ethics is you get kicked out of the community or you get kicked out of the relationship. You know, if you're in a church or something and you, you do something that the whole body of the church thinks is so immoral, usually you get kicked out of that community, kicked out of that church. Or uh, let's say you're in a tribal village thousand years ago and you steal food or something. Uh, well, I mean, that would be, I guess, a law. But you do something that's so offensive to the tribe, they don't want to associate with you. They, they kick you out of the tribe. Let's make it a little simpler. Let's say you're in a friendship and you violate the ethics of the friendship. Maybe you lie or you do something that the friend thinks, dude, that's really violating my loyalty and my trust. You lose the friend. 
Okay, so ethics is a soft form of social control. The rules aren't as succinct. They're not generally written down. They're not as tight, but there's a general sense of what it means to have a moral boundary vis-a-vis -vis you and the person or community you're interacting with, and that the entire purpose of ethics is to maintain trust and connection. Why? So we can have a relationship. So when you violate ethics, you lose the relationship, and that's generally the penalty. It's a soft form of social control. So people are encouraged to behave because they want the benefits of staying in that relationship. They want the benefits of staying in that community. And that's why ethics and morals are so powerful, is we all have a deep need and desire to belong and connect. And so we will, in general, you know, abide by and, and, and want to maintain the ethics and morals of a particular community or relationship to stay in that community or relationship. And then we can grow. And if we make a mistake, we can show uh, contrition, we can show guilt, we can show shame, we can show these different emotions where we're like putting ourselves in check and realizing, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. And then the community or the person can choose to allow us to come back into their connection. And that is what how we grow as human beings. And that's a really important point that we want to be able to grow as human beings because we want to be a better human being. And so the purpose of ethics is to give us opportunities to grow as human beings. Like when you're a little kid, hey, don't do that to your sister. You should share with your brother. Hey, don't, don't hog all the toys or the cookies. Well, you're not going to have the kid go to jail because he hogged the toys and the cookies. You're not going to apply a hard form of social control to a child who's trying to learn how to behave. Why? Because the goal is not to punish them. The goal is to have them elevate into a better version of themselves. That's the purpose of ethics. Okay? Law, and this is important, ethics, once we get grounded in ethics, ethics is awesome because ethics, we apply ethics before harm happens. We learn to be kind, to be good, to be generous, to have high character, to avoid hurting others. That's the point. Law, it's good too, but law usually comes into effect after the harm has happened. It's after the accident has already happened, after the oil spill has happened, after the injury has happened. Then you compensate the person for harm, which is why it's so important that we have a process to figure out what was the harm, what was the injury, how can we compensate, and then how do we execute on that whole system. That's the law, the hard form of social control. This is very important to compensate injury, but the better system is avoid injury in the first place. Okay? That's one of the key distinctions between ethics and law. Ethics is, seeks to avoid the injury. Law seeks to compensate the injury. All right? Now, I'm not saying that laws don't stop people from injuring others. I get it. But the spirit I'm trying to share here, I want you to understand that there's a distinction between the soft form of social control and the hard form of social control. Let me just take a sip of water. All right, let's finish this now. So let's talk about things like I almost hesitate to go here because honestly, I'm a little concerned about censorship and things like that. But if we were to get into things like hate speech or certain types of speech that that certain you know communities want to regulate, okay, the question is, do we want to regulate those types of speech, that type of speech? Do we want to regulate unkind speech through the law or do we want to regulate it through ethics? That's the question. So I totally agree. Certain things shouldn't be said. Certain things are harmful. They're mean. They're nasty. You know, making fun of someone in a way that really hurts them. That sucks. You shouldn't do it. But do we as a society want to regulate that type of speech through ethics? Where if the person speaks that way, they get pushed out of that relationship or they get admonished by a social, you know, by another person so that they can think, you know what? Maybe I really shouldn't act that way. Maybe I should grow a little bit and, and expand my compassion and understand so that I can be a better person. Or do we want to have the legal machinery of the state go after all of those, in, those incidences of negative speech, hurtful speech, to where now the person goes through this legal process, goes through all kinds of steps, and then winds up having to pay a serious physical penalty, right? And, and I understand the arguments, but here's what I'm getting at. At the end of the day, all of this is ultimately ultimately about wanting to create order and social control, right? The law is more about social control. I would say ethics is more about, let's add well-being. That's where we want to get to. Ethics is more about trying to elevate well-being. Law is more about social control. In the realm of certain kinds of negative speech, like hate speech or 
uh, injurious speech, you have to think to yourself, what is going to lead to the best outcome for our for the community of human beings? Because think about it this way. Remember I said about the law, how the law is built? What's the law made of? Remember? What's the law made of? The law is made of words, right? And so words have power because words have meaning. But the question is, well, what words should be included in the words that can't be said? And why should those words not be said? Do we want those words to be included in under the rubric of ethics where, I don't, I don't wanna lose you because I think that might be too abstract. What I'm trying to, let me end it here. What I'm trying to ultimately get at is if a governing body is in control of defining what you can say and what you can't say in the gray area, right? Not in the hard, in the clear area, but in the gray area, do you want the governing body to tell you or do you want the social community to tell you? Do you want friends, family, neighbors to tell you what's okay and what's not okay to say so that you can reframe yourself and, and figure out like, what the hell am I thinking and be a better person? Or do you want the state to tell you what can, say, can be said and cannot be said to where now you have massive physical repercussions to where you maybe don't have a chance to revise yourself. You're now in this other world. And I'm not even gonna tell you which way to go. I have an opinion. But I want you to think to yourself, what is the way that we get to the best outcome? Because remember, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to make the world better, okay? We're trying to get to a, a better place, the marketplace of ideas, political free speech. And the law ultimately is about using clear and critical thinking to balance out and weigh the different harms and benefits of any given rule based on the reason for it. And what we want to do is to go to the best possible outcome, not just looking at the black and white of right and wrong, but also the impact of the rules themselves. That's what I want you to think about. And we'll discuss it in class. Okay.